Wavelength. The real issue with data privacy is who's collecting your data behind the scenes, so in the back end of it, and who is that being shared with? Sparking the combos about Adelaide. It's every woman's choice. If they choose to have an abortion, then so be it. You should be having... These issues need to be properly investigated and we need to make sure that LGBTIQ people are supported to be who they are. On Fresh 92.7... Welcome to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. I'm your host, David, and tonight I am joined for the very first time um, by the amazing Jamie, one of our brilliant reporters here. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastically. You excited to be on co-hosting duties with me? I'm so <laughs> excited. I'm making a step up in the world. I'm just climbing that ladder, you know? <laughs> climbing the fresh ladder. Climbing the fresh ladder. <laughs> one day at a time. One, one day story at a time. At a time. <laughs> anyway, to tonight's show. We've heard plenty about how prevalent sexual harassment is in the workplace and on campuses around Australia. But how much support actually is there for women who go through it? This week on Wavelength, we're exploring whether the tools institutions give victims are enough and what can be done to address the situation. We'll also be letting you know everything you need to know about the coronavirus. But next, Andrew will be asking whether we should go completely cashless here in Australia. You're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. Sparking the convos about Adelaide, you should be having... I don't know about you, Jamie, but I honestly hardly ever have cash on me and basically never use it anymore. I don't know about you, though. I never use it either. I feel like it's one of those, like, really rare occurrences where if I even find, like, a 20 in a jacket pocket, like, that's a bullseye for me. Like, where did it come from, though? Like, yeah, right? Like, how did I pick this up? Right? It's like, how did I forget about this, but also win, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's just so much easier, I feel. Like, I use my phone a lot to pay for things nowadays. I, yeah. I just, love, I just love doing it because, like, I've always got my phone in my hand because I am riddled with internet poisoning. (laughs) So I've always got my phone in my hand, so it's so easy to just use it. But um, Full disclosure, I actually don't have the, like, Apple Pay on my phone and I don't know how to use it. (laughs) I'm really, I'm like, I'm an old person, but I'm like one of those people scared of technology where I'm like, I'm not ready to make the transition. So you're still a debit card gal? I'm 100% ride or die debit card gal. (laughs) Till I die. (laughs) Well, tonight, Andrew, uh, he'll be asking whether it would actually be a good idea for Australia's economy to go cashless. So I'm super keen to hear this one. So here's Andrew. Wavelength. On Fresh 92.7. As you may have heard by now, there's a global pandemic going on. All too many times I went to buy something only to be told cash wasn't accepted. And while this is fine for me with my trusty debit card, for many it's not quite so easy. And this was becoming an issue even before COVID-19 was a thing. With most people using their cards or phones to pay these days, the prospect of a cashless economy is becoming ever more real. And it seems the pandemic may have sped up that process. To find out more, I spoke with Professor Steve Worthington from Swinburne Uni, a man who knows all there is to know about financial services and payment systems, and I began by asking him what a cashless economy really means. Fundamentally, it means that cash is not available to us as consumers, nor is it accepted for payment. It's an economy that's basically fundamentally based on digital transactions. Do you think this is a serious prospect, and has the recent coronavirus pandemic made it more or less likely to happen? Well, I think it's a prospect, but I don't think we'll ever get there. I think we'll have not a cashless economy, but a less cash economy. The COVID pandemic has made it more cashless. We're encouraged to use more digital payments. So this pandemic will have lingering long-term effects on the use of cash, that's for sure. I mean, I know you said you don't think it will happen, but a cashless economy, what sort of impacts would that have, particularly, say, for our older generations? Well, there are certain groups of people, elderly people being one of them in particular, who would suffer from the non-availability of cash. And in many ways, it's becoming a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because we've got less and less ATMs to draw cash from, less and less bank branches open for shorter and shorter hours. So cash is less accessible to us all the time. And that affects people in a certain age bracket, in rural communities, people who've got some disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole lot of people who could be impacted negatively Now, the Reserve Bank of Australia is very keen to acknowledge that and to maintain cash availability, which is one reason why I think it's less cash rather than cashless. And so we already see banks occasionally have issues, you know, with systems going down and that sort of thing. Could that sort of seriously bring things to a standstill if we move to predominantly electronic payments? 
Well, yes, it, it will do, and it already has done uh, with some frequency. It's either the bank's IT systems crashing or it's the telecoms providers crashing, and that's happened again quite recently. And again, these are sort of outages, as they call them, where fundamentally then you're stuck because you can't use an ATM, you can't use your cards, you can't use your phone to make payments. So this is one reason, I think, why many people at least still carry some cash with them just in case. Perhaps on the flip side, is there any particular benefit to businesses or other groups by going cashless? I mean, many businesses already we've seen just flat out don't accept physical cash anymore. Well, I think there are two possible angles here. Number one is taking cash is quite expensive as a means of accepting payments. You've got to take it in, you've got to count it, you've got to secure it, you've got to pay it into a bank. There's a lot of effort and time, etc., cost involved in, in taking cash. So that's one reason perhaps why merchants or people who offer services of, of taking to digital payments. The other angle on this, I think, one that I'm particularly interested in is surcharging. If you pay with a card these days, be it debit or credit card, Card, you're often surcharged a very small amount, but nevertheless, you, you're actually paying for the privilege of using your cards or your phone at the point of sale. And uh, I think Australia is one of the few countries in the world which allows surcharging. And I can see that when we come out of the pandemic, some people might revert to using cash because it, it does not involve any surcharge at all. But is there anything else you'd like to add at all? Well, yeah, two things particularly. I think in terms of cash and its its viability and its success, if you like, I could say it's got the three A's behind it. It's accepted nearly everywhere. It's authentic. You can see it, touch it, feel it. And fundamentally also, it's anonymous. And a lot of people don't like all of their transactions to be recorded or whatever. So there's a, the anonymity of cash is also very useful. And secondly, when we talk about digital payments and using digital banking, etc., I saw something the other week from the Bureau of Statistics. It says that there are 2.5 million Australian citizens, that's 10% of the population, who either have no or irregular connection to the internet. So these people, and some of which, as you mentioned before, are in the elderly but age groups, will be disadvantaged are disadvantaged already and uh, that's another reason why I cannot see a cashless society I can see that we're getting to a less cash society Wavelength sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7 That was Andrew talking to Professor Steve Worthington from Swinburne University about whether Australia should go cashless so many interesting points raised there I mean I first of all want to say like Maybe it's just ageism on my behalf. But, like, I didn't even consider the fact that it would be hard for old people, like elderly people. Um, yeah, absolutely. If it was cashless, because, I mean, they do use a lot more cash and internet banking is probably not their forte. Yeah, absolutely. Like, my grandma still finds it hard to go on Google, let alone, like, sign into her ANZ account. <laughs> yeah. My granddad, I know that he still keeps a giant jar of cash <laughs> in his top cupboard somewhere that he's just been hoarding for years and years, you know. Yeah. Um, I also haven't really noticed it. I... Haven't found that it's hard to find ATMs anywhere around, though. Like, I haven't... Yeah. Like, it's always easy to find one. They're always on street corners, though. Yeah, they're, they're definitely around. In the city, I don't I don't know, maybe if you get further out of the city, it's a bit harder to... Yeah. Find. But, like, I don't know. You probably don't need them on out in the suburbs that badly. <laughs> uh, they're in pretty much every major supermarket. I found there's so many more ATMs now that are just those, like, dodgy ones that charge you, like, $5 to use. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> there's so many of them. I remember being charged, like, seven fifty once when I was overseas, and I just was like, <laughs> the blow, it's not even worth it. <laughs> No. But yeah, it was just, yeah. So, do you think we should go cashless? Should we do it? Oh, I think that it makes sense to go that way, to be completely honest. But I think that it is really important to think of the minorities, such as the elderly and, and people with disabilities as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, as long as it's, you know, working with them to make it easier for everyone instead of just becoming more and more. Uh, exclusive kind of thing but it makes yeah. sense first no cash next we'll be having microchips in our hands you know <laughs> it's a slippery slope <laughs> it's a slippery slope like who knows where we'll be in five years <laughs> oh my gosh well that was really good thank you so much for that one andrew um coming up we'll be getting into our main story for the night about sexual harassment in the workplace and whether the structures in place are actually helping victims or not you're listening to wavelength on fresh 92 7 wavelength Welcome back to Wavelength with David and Jamie tonight, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Earlier this year, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Adelaide was found by an independent corruption commission to have committed serious misconduct by sexually harassing two women at work at a work function in 2019. The story was shocking for a number of reasons. First, he held a seriously prominent role at the uni, but the commissioner's report detailed serious cultural issues at the uni that allowed this to happen, with power imbalances meaning many women were afraid to come forward with accusations. 
It's a story that got a reporter a Miller thinking about what are the systemic institutional problems at places like universities, but also workplaces around the country that enable powerful people like Peter Rathjen to hide in plain sight. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. Peter Rathjen's sexual misconduct became public knowledge in late August, but there has been concern that his behaviour dates back to his time as a professor at the University of Melbourne. The full 170-page report of his misconduct will remain confidential to protect the women who wish to remain anonymous. I talked to director of the Women's Centre, Abby Kendall, about how this misconduct occurs at work in the first place. The law doesn't say you absolutely must have a sexual harassment policy. And I think that's an issue. I mean, we know that sexual harassment is perverse. We know that it's happening in most workplaces in Australia. And we know that men are generally the perpetrators and women the victims. And so what we need are a set of modern laws which require employers to do more a positive obligation to prevent sexual harassment. Is there a concern that workplaces try to hide any cases of sexual harassment? Absolutely, especially where employer or the university or the institution or the you know government agency, whatever it might be, has a reputation for, to protect. Often we find that sexual harassment will occur. It's often perpetrated by people in power, such as managers. Victims often have a lot less power and or not a lot of bargaining power in their workplace. And so it's much easier for an employer just to you know hide it, have their victim of sexual harassment signed a non-disclosure agreement. ICAC released a 12-page statement to the public about the Vice-Chancellor's misconduct. Within that report, it detailed how the university's HR department sought legal advice. They were told not to refer Rathjen's allegations to the council of the university, even though the council is the body that employs Rathjen. If Adelaide University had some policies and or, you know, bylaws about what they had to do, what the Chancellor has to do when they get a complaint of sexual harassment, what a manager has to do when they get a complaint of sexual harassment, what a professor has to do when they get a complaint of sexual harassment, what the head cleaner has to do when they get a complaint of sexual harassment, then it wouldn't be vague uh, as to what the person needs to do and which parts of the university they need to, need to be made aware of the complaint. And so... I think a lesson from that is it's really important to have transparent policies about exactly what happens when a sexual harassment complaint is made at any level of the university structure or any institutional structure. SRC Women's Officer Rebecca Etienne. It took a year and a half for any kind of findings to reach the general university community, so staff and students. And a year and a half, a lot can happen in that time and a lot didn't happen in that time. Do HR departments take it seriously? Is there also a failure within that bubble to actually rectify the problem? They absolutely can. And really that goes back to, is it easy to face the problem head on when there's possible reputational damage, but also profit damage as well? Or is it easier to sweep it under the rug, pay some amount of money to a victim of um, sexual harassment and then, and then you know, maintain the perpetrator's position within the, within the organisation or the institution? I think it, for many HR departments, it, that can be a sort of no-brainer because they want to get rid of the problem quickly. What we have now, though, is a society and a community of women who are talking publicly about their experiences. And so where you are able to wear these stories and gags and you're able to speak publicly about your experience, then you're already causing reputational damage to the institution. And at that point, there's a lot of pressure on the institution to do something about the issue. To see for the future of the faculty and students at the University of Adelaide. I feel like there isn't a lot done, but having these tough conversations about misogyny, sexism and the misuse of authority and power of people in charge, to have these conversations, it is really, really important and we need to be the change we want to see in the world. So that's exactly what we need to do. We need to continue fighting the good fight, standing up for survivors and keeping the university and perpetrators accountable for their actions. Wavelength. Sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. So this Peter Rathjen story is absolutely kind of crazy. I mean, so the work function in 2019, uh, sexually assaulted two women, kissed one of them, um, sort of got away with it for a while. And now, um, yeah, I guess he had 
did, oh, I also just found that he, I got a $326,400 payout. Wow. Yeah. That is just so disappointing to hear because, you know, you hear these cases, especially after the Me Too movement that came out where it's like people are being held there. They're held accountable for their actions now a lot more than they were and mm-hmm. women are feeling a lot more. There's more of a safe environment to come out in these situations. Yeah. Um, but we just hope that he would be held accountable for these kind of things and it's just yeah. the fact that he's, like, able to hide behind his payout is just... Yeah. No. I know, I know. It just sucks. It's, that's so much money. Um, it's so much money. Yeah, I think I think you're so right about the Me Too movement stuff. It has, in, like, given women more confidence to come out with these accusations, but I think what this case specifically shows is that there's, like, systemic problems that you can't get around, like, no matter how, like... You might have signed some sort of NDA, non-disclosure agreement sort of thing. Or, yeah. And, like, it seems like when I was reading about this case um, that it was so extremely well-known in, like, the academic community. Like, I was reading tweets, people being like, the most damning thing about this is that p- people weren't surprised. Yeah, not like people at knew. All. Yeah, and I think it's, it's that thing of like it's the university's job to be held accountable to protect people, you know, their colleagues and the students as well. So it's like, what are mm-hmm. they doing? Well, we'll be getting back into that story from Amila soon, but coming up, we'll be letting you know what the hell is going on in politics. You're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. We'll be getting back into our story about sexual harassment in the workplace soon, but now let's throw to Hamish to let us know what the hell is going on with politics this week. What the hell is going on in politics at the moment? Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. There's a lot to unpack this week, as usual, so let's get to it. Victorian police made 16 arrests on Saturday as anti-lockdown protests broke out across the state during chaotic scenes where demonstrators were rounded up by officers on horseback. The protesters had been organising the event through the use of encrypted messages and warned that further protests would follow in the coming days until restrictions in Victoria ease. Meanwhile, over 70 victims of the crowd crush incident that occurred at the Lawn Falls Festival back in 2016 have reached a $7 million settlement in a class action lawsuit that has lasted four years. The participants of the lawsuit all suffered various injuries, some of which were permanent, when they were caught in a stampede of people trying to move from one stage to another in a result of negligent venue management. Also making headlines, Wham Clothing, the company that holds the license for the Aboriginal flag design, entered discussions with the federal government this week about selling the copyright. An inquiry went underway about the flag's exclusive license, which became especially awkward when Wham refused to reveal how many cease and desist letters it had sent to Aboriginal communities about reproducing the design. Finally, former PM Tony Abbott had his passport details and phone number obtained by a hacker this week, and the government announced that job seekers will still need to apply for eight jobs a month, despite the nation entering into recession. And that's what the hell's been going on in politics this week. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thank you for that one, Hamish. Stay tuned for part two of Amilla's story about where she'll be finding out what can be done to make workplaces safer when it comes to sexual misconduct. Right now, though, you're listening to Fresh 92.7. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. Before the break, Amilla dived into a story that sparked a broader conversation about sexual misconduct in the workplace. Yeah, that story about Peter Rastian is just so disappointing for plenty of reasons. But the fact that so many people were just not surprised about the findings is perhaps the most damning. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, in part two, Amila explores more generally issues with workplace sexual misconduct and what can be done about the systemic problems. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. According to a 2018 Australian Human Rights Commission survey, 72% of Australians over the age of 15 have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetimes. In Australia, only 17% of incidents regarding sexual harassment at work are ever reported. Joining me to discuss how workplace harassment impacts victims and the roadblocks to justice is Associate Professor at the University of Technology, Sydney, Karen O'Connell. So Karen, why do we see so little cases go all the way to court when it comes to sexual harassment? Well... In some ways, having few cases go to court can be a good outcome. It could mean 
that cases are getting settled along the way in positive ways for the victim of sexual harassment. But in fact, I don't think that is the case. Very few number of cases even getting reported, say, within a workplace. What you see is that the few cases that go to court represent the tiniest number of experiences of sexual harassment that are out there. Why do we see such little numbers of sexual harassment actually being reported? Sadly, one of the big reasons is people just think that people won't think it's serious enough that, you know, they won't be taken seriously if they make a report. Surprisingly, I think, uh, they're also concerned about the person who harassed them. So there are actually stats are, I think it's 16% of people don't report because they're worried about the consequences for their harasser. What is one of the biggest problems we see when it comes to sexual harassment law and how it works? When you are requiring individuals to bring complaints, puts way too much pressure on that person who's already experienced mistreatment. Often there's a power differential. Often, you know, they do feel at risk if they speak up. So I think a much more effective approach is to look at a whole workplace and have requirements on employers and on workplace participants that there be a a general culture is is non-hostile on gender and other grounds and actually creates an environment where people can work safely. You mentioned that there's a heavy onus on the person who's been harassed to come forward about what's happened to them. Does this imbalance mean that people who are harassers can get away with what they're doing? Absolutely, I do. I think that what you often would see in this area is instead of people bringing complaints because it just it seems too overwhelming, they might move to sideways into a, another role to avoid a person who's harassing them or they may even leave their job or look for alternative work. It's often then only in reflection or looking at what's happened to their career over time that they might see that those actions really had quite a big effect on on them, on their career progression, on them financially, on their health in terms of stress. So I think that, you know, people sort of being pressured into taking their own personal responses to sexual harassment can have quite an intense impact on people that might not even be understood at the time. Are there any positive things we're seeing workplaces do to help tackle issues of sexual harassment? So we're starting to see that some organisations are committing to not having NDAs that prevent the, the person who reported the sexual harassment that doesn't silence those people. And I'm actually very much in favour of that because I think that the issue of silence and non-transparency right across the sexual harassment system is a problem. Are there any final thoughts or comments you'd like to add? What I think is a broader issue here is to ask why so many women want it to be confidential or private. And I think that's the more disturbing issue. You know, people are often with good reason a bit worried that they might be victimised or have retaliation if they speak up. And I think that's what we need to tackle as well. We need to create workplace cultures where it's safe and even embraced to speak up about problem behaviour in the interest of more positive cultures. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. So there was definitely a lot going on in that part two of Miller's story. I think what really stood out to me as a general theme is that, like, the way that I guess sexual harassment policy, that like the way that businesses operate and manage sexual harassment, the systems in place are really passive. Mm. So like it'll, instead of being proactive and um, educating and preventing sexual harassment from happening in the workplace, the system is set up so that they wait for people to file reports. They wait till after it's happened yeah, they rather than them. stopping it from happening in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there needs to be so much more importance and accountability put in place of of establishing a baseline of like, this is not okay, this is what we stand for, mm-hmm. instead of just being like, we've got this system in place when it happens, you know? Yeah. Expecting that yeah. it will happen. Like, exactly. Like that's so... It's like conceding backwards. defeat before... Yeah. Like, because... Yeah, you're so right though because it is like admitting that it's just there yeah, in a way. Absolutely. And they can't do anything about it. So we just have a good HR system in place and they're just protecting their own skin essentially. It feels like yeah. there needs to be so much more done in terms of like caring for the people in the workplace, which are 
most of the time women getting assaulted in these instances. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, more power. We need more power to them. We need more protection of them. They need to feel like they're they're being looked after. You know, yeah. Like from day one, you aren't going into a new workplace scared or worried yeah. or signing some sort of NDA. Yeah, very intense story, but thank you so much for putting that one together, Emila. Um, that was just a such, great story. Yeah, such an important conversation to have. Um, anyway, next Wavelength explains everything you need to know about what's happened with the coronavirus this week, but right now you're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Right now, we're getting into a weekly segment where Wavelength explains what has happened with the coronavirus this week. Wavelength. On Fresh 92.7. Do you remember when Australia got their first COVID-19 case? Or when South Australia got theirs? I had a guess at this and I was way off. And when I looked it up, I was actually pretty surprised how early it was. Before I tell you though, let's first go to Britain, who, according to their officials, are at a COVID-19 tipping point and are at serious risk of being forced into a second national lockdown. Recently, they've had more than 4,000 cases per day and any Brit who now breaks a self-isolation direction risks a $17,000 fine. Staying international, over in the US, the coronavirus death toll has officially reached 200,000. And an equally chilling stat is that about 25% of Americans now say that they know someone that has died of the virus. But here in Australia, things are looking better, and that even includes Victoria. Yesterday, the VIX reported just 14 new cases. That's the lowest daily figure since the start of their second wave that they've had. Even more importantly, though, it helped push Melbourne's 14-day average down to 36, which is below the city's target of 50, and that means some restrictions are now being lifted. And the restrictions will further ease if they can get their 14-day average under just five. Finally, here in SA, some more good news. We opened our border up to the ACT, so that's great. You can go on a holiday to Canberra. I guess you could relive your year six school trip to federal parliament? Uh, I get it, okay, okay, if that doesn't float your boat, then why not consider a staycation instead? A new scheme in SA will give staycationers a cash voucher to stay in select accommodation across South Australia. Bookings in the CBD will be eligible for up to $100, and for staying in regional accommodation, you could get back up to 50 bucks. The state opposition are already calling for the vouchers to be even more, up to 200. So with the scheme set to start in mid-October, a staycation could be a great way to support our state and uh, take your mind off uh, coronavirus a little bit. Oh, and as for Australia's and South Australia's first cases, they were the 19th and 21st of January. Boy, I guessed off the top of my head March for when we had our first case. I was way off. Clearly, I need a holiday and a whole bunch of those staycation vouchers. Wavelength, sparking the combos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That right there was Sam letting you know everything you need to know about the coronavirus this week. You're listening to Fresh 92.7. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. Jamie, now it's your time to shine. <laughs> you, Woohoo! You put together this week's Heaps Good News segment for us, and I'm so excited to hear it. I'm actually really stoked for this one. <laughs> I feel like this is my new little Heaps Good News baby that's just grown into a beautiful flower. <laughs> you were so keen to do it. You asked me weeks ago, like, David, can I have this date? I just love... <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> I just love these little segments, because, like, the happy news, like, there's so many random things out there, and I'm just like, I'm a sucker for an animal story. Oh, yeah. So, like, I'm just dropping the little breadcrumbs now. This might be some stuff in there. I am so thrilled. I can't wait to hear it. Let's <laughs> let's hear it. Do it. I know there's gonna be... Heaps good news on Wavelength. With an abundance of seemingly negative news, it's nice to be able to focus on the good stuff. There's always a heaps good news story out there, and this week, we're on top of it. After decades of vaccination campaigns, Africa is officially free from wild polio. Africa has been declared free from wild polio by the independent body, the Africa Regional Certification Commission. Polio usually affects children under five, leading to irreversible paralysis and death. While there's no cure for polio, the polio vaccine protects children for life. The polio vaccine was first invented in 1952 and Nelson Mandela's Kick Polio Out of Africa program launched in 1996, which mobilised millions of health workers around Africa to hand deliver the vaccine. More than 95% of Africa's population has now been immunised, averting an estimated 1.8 million cases of wild polio virus. This has been said to be one of the greatest success stories of all time, a milestone for the health industry. 
A Malaysian man has caused social media havoc after claiming his lost phone turned up full of selfies of monkeys. 20-year-old Zachrids Rodzi reported that he was sleeping at home when his phone went missing and heard it ringing outside his house the next day. Rodzi looked over to discover that not only had a monkey stolen his phone, but had recorded multiple videos trying to eat the device and used up all of his storage. Zachrids said monkeys don't usually commit robberies in the neighborhood and he suspects it broke in through his brother's window. Monkey say, monkey do, monkey take selfies? Do you miss flying as much as we do? Good news, now you can. Qantas has just released its first ever flight to nowhere. For just $800 economy, passengers can enjoy scenic views of Australian icons such as Uluru, the Great Barrier Reef, Byron Bay, Bondi Beach and Sydney Harbour. The flight is due for takeoff from Sydney in October and will take around seven hours round trip. Qantas says the plane will fly down to 4,000 feet to get passengers as close as possible to these landmarks, with many more flights like this planned for the future. Who's up for a trip? I'm Jamie and thanks for listening to Heaps Good News. Wavelength. Sparking the combos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thank you for that, Jamie. That was so good. <laughs> the monkey. So um, <laughs> earlier today you showed me the video so, oh, and the photos. Yeah, yeah. So good. So, so the news article that I found the story from has um, also given all of the photos from the dude's phone of the monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like hundreds of photos of these like really <laughs> crazed monkeys like looking into your soul. It's like, so strange. It's just like perfect like photos of the monkey's face. Like some of them look pretty good. <laughs> yeah. like, they've definitely done this before. I like know, they've, post them on the It looks like they've, been, po- yeah, they've been practicing this. Monkey like, needs to get Instagram. <laughs> monkey needs to get Insta photos. <laughs> and the uh, polio story, that's so good. Like we've got the coronavirus going crazy around the world, but at least no more polio in Africa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's actually like a really beautiful... Um, like a really beautiful thing for the health industry. Like one of the biggest things that's ever happened in yeah. the health industry in our huge. time, I think. Like so huge. So while there is all of this like, craziness going on with the coronavirus, like it's still nice to hear that there's some really good things happening yeah. out there. You know, one thing's coming in, but another thing's cured. So, <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> the way it goes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Thank you so much for listening, Adelaide. And thank you, Jamie, for jumping in tonight. It's been thank you. really lovely having you. I had such a good time today. This is awesome. Let's yeah, do it again. Absolutely. Um, make sure you're subscribed to the Wavelength podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can listen back to our old episodes right now, and you'll be the first to know when tonight's episode goes up. Wavelength.